Rise for the rise, the wakening sky, spray to the morning light. The wind makes us sleep in the arms of the dawn like a child that has cried. Come, let us gather our nets from the shore and set our catamaran in free. From the verses of the poem Coromandel Fishers, I wholeheartedly welcome the gathering for the endowment lecture on role of extension and advisory services in enabling innovation. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So I kindly request everyone to stand up for the company agric business management. Generated the need and interest among farmers on entrepreneurship. He cherished the noble ideas for the society as an investment through his scholars. He's a cordial and warm personality. With these accolades, we are happy to invite Dr. N. Venkatesa Palaniswami, the Dean Agri TNAU, to offer the welcome address. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of who are participating in this endowment lecture through online and offline. Um, and it is my great pleasure to be part of this endowment lecture organized by the Department of Agriculture, Extension, and Rural Sociology. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me uh, as an in-charge dean of today's uh, postgraduate studies. Sir, DNA uh, is a uh, pioneering in uh, education, research, and uh, extension. In particular, uh, we are uh, taking uh, the students to the exposure in way of uh, different exposures, uh, both participatory and inviting the experts in the respective fields. Uh, for uh, exposing the uh, current uh, scenario of the agriculture and the allied sciences uh, in the uh, field of agriculture, for the enabling the our students in, capabili in uh, capabilities and uh, their expertise in the in their career. So with this, uh, uh, our with the great support of our honourable and respected Vice Chancellor, Madam, we are. Uh, Three hand to organize uh, a different endowment lecture under the postgraduate study is uh, dean office, in which we give an opportunity for all the department to have an endowment lecture in the respective fields, so that every one of the uh, uh, department as well as the other department people can uh, learn the new things in the respective fields. So, in this point of view, uh, department of uh, Agriculture Extension and uh, Rural Sociology is uh, kind enough to organize this lecture on role of extension and advisory services in South Palm is, is, uh, is in enabling innovations. So, in this point of view, you, you saw uh, the today's uh, uh, guest uh, professor, uh, Rasid Suleiman Sir, is a director of the uh, private center for research, research uh, and innovation and science, scientific policies. Really, he was the former uh, professor, uh, principal scientist in our ICR, and he got volunteer retirement and he promoted this center, particularly educating the agriculture officers and agriculture scientists and also other stakeholders in particular farmers, inclusive of farmers. That point of view, really, we are very great, sir. We are very happy and we are very grateful to you for accepting our invitation and come over from Hyderabad to Bayamuthur and delivering, going to deliver a great lecture on the uh, today's topic. So with this, uh, I am really happy to invite you uh, and I also welcome you, sir. Next, uh, my friend and uh, director of uh, cars. Dr. Suresh Kumar, I am welcoming him for facilitating this uh, endowment lecture. Uh, he is an instrumental person in uh, innovating the new things in research uh, and uh, education and also extension. So with this, uh, I am welcoming you, Director, to uh, going to give an uh, introductory note on uh, this topic as well as the speaker. And also, I am thankful to the Professor Engert uh, for organizing and uh, initiating this uh, uh, role of uh, 
uh, that is role of uh, extension and advisory services in enabling memory in India, field of agriculture and knowledge science. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kathiye has always uh, innovated in new technology, starting in agriculture extension since 1997. I know him. He, uh, in the inception of the introduction to me itself, he is uh, applying his uh, extension technology in my tech management, and uh, after that, he involved in uh, uh, Eva, something like that, Eva Lame and uh, sponsored by ML Lame, like that. He is uh, one of the pioneering in bringing innovation in extension education. Uh, so, really, uh, very thankful to Dr. Kathiyayin for arranging this great lecture because it's the need of the day. If you see the uh, change in agriculture and also change in technology, we have to bring the new innovations in transfer of technology and also. Uh, training the farmers so that uh, new uh, ICT tools can be applied in a shorter time uh, the developed technology and uh, other things uh, can able to reach the farmers in time so that farmers can um, adapt it in a shorter period. Uh, in that point, with these few words, I welcoming every one of the scientists, students and uh, principals and deans of uh, affiliated and constant colleges and students of earlier and constant teachers and main campus, those who are attending this endowment lecture through online and offline, every one of you, I am welcoming you. Uh, and uh, please patiently uh, listen and take note of the lecture and kindly uh, try to in incorporate in your research proposals as well as education and extension. So, sir, so that uh, we have to improve the uh, doubling the farmers by 2025. Okay, with this uh, introductory remarks, uh, I, I request uh, very one of you for providing this opportunity. Thank you, Ananda. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, a water economist, thirst for research in irrigation modeling, his cascading projects speak volume upon him. A workaholic director, a winsome personality. With these laudatory remarks, we are overwhelmed to invite Dr. D. Suresh Kumar, director of CARTS TNAU, to deliver the introductory note on the speaker. Most uh, distinguished uh, and respected, uh, the chief guest, Dr. Rashid Suleiman, uh, my friend, uh, the Dean Agriculture, uh, Dr. Nankesh uh, Kulinasamy, uh, uh, Dr. Kartege, Prof. Head, Agriculture uh, Extension, former uh, director, uh, uh, director of Planning and Monitoring, Dr. Venkabu Dusra, Dr. Rashid, uh, uh, Dr. Gopal sir, no? colleagues at uh, Cox, and my dear student friends. Good afternoon once again, and I'm very happy to be here as part of this uh, endowment lecture. Uh, really, I'm very, very happy, and I feel proud and honored to give you an introductory note of an eminent person in agriculture elections in the country. Of course, I had a chance to work with several extension scientists across the country and seen several series. Uh, I would say this is one of the best CV I have ever seen from agricultural extension this <clears throat> so really, I'm very happy to see you, sir, here. Uh, probably some of you might be knowing that, uh, sir, you know, when Dr. Venkatesh Kunisam, my friend, was uh, indicating in his uh, welcome address that uh, Dr. Rashid, sir, actually resigned, left uh, the, the prestigious scientist person in the Agricultural Research Service from ICF and started his four. So that itself shows he's capable of doing research on his own and that proves that he is actually a best researcher and a social architect and a, a freelance consultant. Really, we are proud to have you here, sir. Uh, I, I, on behalf of the Directorate of Cars, I once again welcome in joining hands with uh, our Dean, uh, PGD. <coughs> yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, actually, 
uh, I need uh, minimum two days to, uh, you know, tell his achievements kind of thing. But uh, for want of time, I try to, uh, you know, indicate some of his key achievements in brief. Uh, Dr. Rashid Suleiman is uh, currently the director of Center for Research and Innovation and Science and Policy. In brief, it's uh, CRISP. And prior to starting this, he has been actually he had worked as a senior scientist at NCAP. You know, NCAP is National Center for Agricultural Economics and Policy Research. And now it is called ICR NIA, National Institute of Agricultural Policy. So that is actually one of the premier institutes in India conducting policy and research in agricultural economics and social sciences in general. So he has expertise in agricultural extension system and policy and has worked on uh, applications of agricultural innovation systems. Uh, his research broadly covers the, the role of private sector in extension, developing new approaches to reaching rural women and evaluation of ICTs in agriculture. He leads AESA, AESC, Agricultural Extension in South Asia Network, and is a member of the board of the Global Forum for uh, Rural Advisory Services. I, uh, I, you know, so this is the first time I'm, I, I came to know that there is actually a kind of network for agricultural extension in South Asia. So because we know, as an economist, we have actually South Asian network for development and environmental economics, Sandy. That is a very popular network in, uh, you know, South Asia that builds capacity building among the young researchers. And I'm very happy to know that uh, he leads ASA. And... Uh, Dr. Rashid Suleiman holds a PhD in agricultural elections from IRA, you know, that it is a premier institute in the country. So basically, he has actually 28 years of experience, research experience uh, in agricultural extension, agricultural innovation systems, and program evaluation. So managing and coordinating research programs in South Asia, so that is actually one of the key tasks he performs. And he holds the key positions in a number of professional bodies and policy-making bodies, like member in national and international policy think tanks. Main major areas of research include agricultural actions and systems and policies, application of innovation system framework in agriculture research and extension, exploring the role of science, technology, and innovations to achieve SDGs, role of private sector and public sector uh, public-private partnership in agriculture research and extension, developing new approaches to uh, reaching rural women and evaluation of high cities in agriculture. Currently, he holds most of the uh, prestigious positions, like member in Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, key focal point in you know, AESA, member of the steering committee of FEO, Tropical Agriculture Platform, served as uh, commissioner, CGAR program, like the Commission on Ag Sustainable Agriculture Intensification, and serve as the chair, steering committee of the Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services. In 2021, he led very, very important thing, you know, so the drafting of the uh, indicator framework for national extension and advisory service systems, metrics for performance and outcome measurement for FAO. And then in 2012, uh, he led the drafting of the new extensionist portion paper for GFRAS. And in 2008, he co authored the South Asia Regional Agriculture Research Strategy document for DFI. You know, DFID. DFID is the Department for International Development, that is actually one of the uh, very big international donor. Uh, development agency working on the you know growth and development of the particularly the developing countries. Okay, uh, so contributed to the development of country program framework, uh, document of government of India FAO in 2012-13, and authored one of the key uh, book chapter, knowledge generation and management for the government of India FAO national medium term priority framework in 2008-9. In addition to this, you know, so he actually, uh, as I indicated earlier, he held a key position as a scientist, you know, so the principal scientist in the NCAP and currently the director. Really, we are uh, 
fortunate enough to have you here, sir, to listen to your, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, endowment lecture of the current uh, um, policy relevance. I, I sincerely hope that the the endowment lecture would largely benefit both the students and faculty across campuses in TN, TNAU. And uh, at this juncture, actually, I would like to appreciate uh, that Kartikeyan uh, in identifying a right person. Okay, uh, uh, you know he should have taken a lot of uh, words and pains to in bringing uh, Dr. Rashid Suleiman. So you know he is very busy person and uh, he is running a important think tank uh, that actually uh, supplies various inputs to the different policy making units in the country and. Uh, Global level. Okay, so in that sense, uh, really, I appreciate Dr. Kartikeyan for your efforts. Always, the Department of Financial Actions is very keen in doing. I think, really, I'm very happy about the progress that is happening in the Agricultural Actions Department. And I also appreciate you know, the faculty members, Ashwagandha and Nirmala, and particularly the students. You know, so really, it's, uh, it's really amazing to see uh, the students' involvement in all the activities. Maybe the driving force, the senior professor, like the regular professor. Okay. With this, uh, I once again uh, welcome you, sir, uh, for uh, the course TNA Council for delivering this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Graduated from the College of Horticulture, KU Trishu, obtained his doctorate from IAR in New Delhi. Close to a decade, he had been working in agricultural extension in South Asia focal point put forth two and a half decades of postdoctoral expertise and research, a stalwart in agricultural innovation systems and rural innovation management, managing and communicating research programs, an able communicator, his advisory services are noteworthy. His policy initiates speak volume upon him. He's a member in steering committee of Global Forum of Rural Advisory Services, a member of FAO Tropical Agricultural Platform, a leading and popular social scientist his vast experience benefited innumerable number of research scholars to become contagious in research aptitude. With these applauding achievements, we kindly invite Dr. V. Rashid Sulaiman, Director, Center for Research on Innovation and Science Policy, Hyderabad, to offer an endowment lecture on the role of extension and advisory services in enabling innovation. Welcome, sir. Okay, thank you. How can I see my slide? It's already here, I believe. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for... Uh, the invitation to, to TNAU. Uh, I think the first time I came here was when I was doing my MSc in, in Tichu. So I came for the literature review in the TNAU library. So I think that is the first time I came to the to the to TNAU. And after that, no, there are many times you now I, I came here. Um, actually, the topic which I wanted to speak is on extension advisory services in enabling innovation. So we have been hearing about innovation. I think all students in extension have know, heard about innovation, have studied innovation. But uh, so one may think, what is new in this whole, in this whole area of, of innovation? I basically organized my presentation like this because I wanted to talk about why innovation and what we mean by innovation currently because the term innovation has evolved considerably over the last uh, five decades. From 60s, our understanding of innovation in the 60s is different from our understanding of innovation currently. And I also wanted to bring the, 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 the framework of agricultural innovation system. Then the question is about how do we enable innovation and what is the role of advisory services to enable innovation? In what capacities are we are needed? I also wanted to talk about scaling up because everybody wants innovation and impact currently. You, the governments, policy makers, donors, everybody wanted innovation and at an impact at a scale. Not about few villages we have covered kind of a thing. We need the innovation impact at a scale. So you have the the paper. I think the paper that has been printed and distributed. So I I don't know. Maybe you may not have got the time to look into it. My main argument in the paper has been that extension suffers from two types of disconnect. One is a one is a contextual disconnect because the problems have changed. 
when extension was uh, set up in many of the developing countries, it was all about increasing productivity, increasing productivity, increasing production. But now, we, de we have to deal with a large number of other challenges in the field. So we are not only talking about only increasing productivity, but we need to deal with natural resource management, adaptation to climate change, uh, linking farmers to markets, uh, retaining and attracting and retaining youth in agriculture, new standards. The question is, how our capacities, do we have the capacities, extension have the capacities to deal with these new challenges? That is number one. So that is the kind of a contextual, because the context has changed. When extension was evolved, the context was different, but now we face with a new set of set of challenges. So that is one so one thing which we are now talking about. Another is the conceptual kind of a disconnect. Extension is still viewed as a as a messenger between the research and the kind of farmers. Because the policy also frames the role of extension as an agency which sits between uh, research and farmers. Whereas the contemporary understanding of innovation, how innovation happens, that has all changed. We have a new and better understanding about how innovation happens. And people talk about interactive relationships among a number of actors. That is how innovation happens. Not through risk transferring messages, research transferring knowledge to farmers. So there is a, that's a, the two disconnects which I want to, I basically focus. But I just, in this presentation, I just wanted to focus more on the conceptual disconnect between the evolution of innovation as a as a discipline, as a science, as a new set of practice, than what is contemporarily, what is most of the time we we talk about extension about. So the question is, why are we talking about innovation, innovation systems? We never heard about innovation or innovation systems. At least in the I think 10 years before, nobody was talking about innovation. Innovation systems, we, we, we need to strengthen innovation. People were talking only about a research strategy. So you can see if the, now the CDIR is coming with a research and innovation strategy. Ten years before, they were only having a research strategy. Similarly, science, technology, innovation policy. We had only in the 80s, 90s, we had only science and technology policy, a and policy. Now it's science, technology, and innovation policy. That means innovation is getting, the term innovation is getting mainstreamed into science, technology, innovation discussions. It is getting mainstreamed into research and extension organizations for a number of reasons, because one is dealing with complex challenges. Because our challenges, which I said initially about linking farmers to markets, natural resource management, sustainability, or new standards, all of them needs collective action, group action. It's not like individual farmers can solve these kind of things. So you need new frameworks to address these kind of problems. Another is, there is all, there's a lot of discontent among the policy makers about the poor performance of research and extension, especially in marginal environments and especially in dealing with complex elements. So there's a lot of people are now talking about, okay, we need innovation, so and innovation systems is important. As I said before, I think this is an important slide because we need to understand how the term, how the innovation, the term innovation has evolved. I think in the 60s, 70s, I think we, you all know about the diffusion of innovations, the, the Rogers publication. So they all talk about innovation as something, as a new technology developed by research. Later on, many people like Robert Chambers, you should know all these people in, in your in discipline. So they basically talked about, no, 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 farmers also innovate. It's not merely the science that is the source of innovation. So people started talking about farmer innovation. But in all these framings in the beginning, it was all about extension as an agency that is communicating information, communicating information on or communicating new knowledge. So that's the role. Later on, many people started talking about new ways of working. Because it's not merely, for instance, even the farmer producer organizations, cooperatives, they are institutional innovation. They are not, there's no technology per se in any of these kind of things, even a farmer field school. So these are all institutional innovations, new ways of working. So in the 80s, there is a lot of people like is rolling, many of them, especially from the wagoning, and they worked on many of these, and they said, Innovation happens through an interaction. So the role of extension is to facilitate interaction among many of the actors in the agricultural knowledge and information system. There is a concept no? which, was, which was talking about uh, research, extension, education thing. But from 2000 onwards, addition, a lot of research has gone into. Now people talk about innovation 
is not any of those kind of things. They talk about innovation as a, as a process of knowledge generation, adaptation, diffusion, and use. So they make a difference between invention and innovation. Invention is what the scientists often do is an invention. But if it has to become an innovation, it has to be adapted, diffused, used by a large number of people leading to social and economic changes. So this is the new understanding about innovation. So if you, look, if you trace the history of these, you know, the, whole, the whole publications, so 60s we started with the diffusion of innovations. We have the fifth volume, that's a different story. But then people like Robert Chambers came with this case of the farmer first idea, farmers also innovate, we need to support them. Then the Niels Rawlings publication on extension science. In between, we also need to place the publication by Dr. Brandon Bank on I think Brandon Bank and Hawking Agricultural Extension. But then when it comes to the late 90s, so there are publications on wheelbarrows full of frogs. I think these are all about people who look at innovation from a social learning, from, a, from those kind of a theories. And then this Case Lewis publication, Communication for Rural Innovation. So that is basically talking about different types of communication that is needed if you really wanted to facilitate innovation. And then they talk about innovation is something like a shared, that needs a shared learning among multiple stakeholders. They talk about the natural resource management. So where innovation can happen only when you have one varied of stakeholders have to be brought to the, you don't have to worry many of them because no, whether it's a participatory irrigation management or watershed management in many areas, you, know, you need really multiple stakeholders to be brought together. The same holds for many of our new problems like linking farmers to markets, where it is not a simple adoption by one particular farmer. So the idea is around the innovation has changed, and then if you look at the World Bank application, 2006 Enhancing Agricultural Innovation, 2012 Agricultural Innovation Systems. So these elaborated on the role of research, extension, organizations, I introduced the idea of knowledge brokers, innovation management. So there's a lot that has happened after the diffusion of innovations came into the came into the scene. But unfortunately, you know, there is a we have we have been seeing in within extension that there is too much dependency on the diffusion of innovations kind of a paradigm, a typology of you know adopters, the S curve. So we need to learn it, but then we should learn it as a history. But we should not be learning it as something as a solution or as a kind of our framework. So this is the point which I wanted to say. And then I, I put all these cover images to, just to, to show you that these are the publications we should have been, we should have read, read it, at least at the master's level. PhD is too late to learn any of these kind of things. But then if you have not read, and all these, most of these documents are available online. It's not like, no, we have to order for a copy or any of this kind of thing. So there's a lot of information available on, on the innovation. As I told you, you know, there's a lot of critique on the diffusion of innovation, the Rogers kind of an approach. But people have challenged it. People have now dismissed it in many cases, saying that oh, this no longer works. Actually, one paper which all of you should read is this one. It's a rethinking technological change in small folder agriculture. I think this is a recent paper. I think this is Dominic Glover. So these are the he did a, a detailed review. If you cannot get that copy, it's, it's published in Outlook on Agriculture. I have a soft copy which I can share with, uh, uh, with Professor Kartigan in the WhatsApp or the email. This is a paper which you should compulsory read to understand how the idea about innovation has changed and the dangers in using the Rogers Diffusion of Innovations model to understand technological change. So I think this is something which you should read. So this is the 2019 uh, uh, paper. But actually, you know, in 2002, actually, when I was in NCAP itself, we basically talked about, you know, we need to move beyond technology dissemination. We really want extension to really, uh, to become relevant to the changing, to the contemporary demands, to become relevant, we need to move and we need to look for new theories and frameworks in, in communication, innovation, and extension. So I think these are the, because I am going to say knowledge. I think the social, the kind of you know, knowledge about the, so, the, the so society, the knowledge about the policies. So different pieces of knowledge have to be put together if you really want to have innovation. So only focusing on, so many people even tell, believe that well, technology is a starting point for innovation. No, technology is not a starting, not always a starting point at, at, at certain points. So we need to challenge our own assumptions about how technical change happens. 
And if you cannot, if you don't understand these kind of uh, new thinking, new theories, we, I mean, especially if you are having an MSc and a PhD, people expect us to know many of these kind of things. So I think this is something which you should be, which you should focus. And if you have not read it, you should, you should read this, this paper, because this uh, first paper with the Glover, the Dominic Glover paper, it's a real good review on what all things have happened since the diffusion of innovation, uh, innovation days. So now people are talking everywhere, talking about agricultural innovation systems. Even the ICR, the National Agricultural Innovation Program, NAIP, was also basically built around some of these ideas because if innovation has to happen, people really, there's no point in only strengthening the research system or an extension system because traditionally we have, we have an NARP, National Agricultural Research Project, we have a National Agricultural Extension Project. Now people believe that unless the whole system is upgraded, you cannot have innovation. These have all come from studies. These have all come from studies. It's not theory. These have all come from studies which are looked into different sectors in different countries and come up with these kind of frameworks. That means extension sits in the middle. They are part of the bridging organization where there are not there are there are many people, players, public, private, civil society. So we are part of the so where extension fits in the agricultural innovation system because we are a bridging organization, not merely between the research and farmers. Because even today, same times we are we we depict as something between research and farmer, I say. But then we are here we are now talking about extension playing a role of connecting, bridging action, bridging relationships, facilitating knowledge flows among these very different actors. So if you don't understand this innovation system, which I will explain in a, in, a, in, a, in a bit, uh, later with an example. So the new understanding is innovation is a process. This can be facilitated. It needs interactions among these large number of people. In many cases, these organizations in these different boxes don't speak to each other. And that is why we don't have uh, the required competence. So people have studied in different countries so what is why one country is very good? For instance, a simple example is the if you look at the plywood. I think all these tables in this in this room, or I think these all might have come from either Thailand, like we we might have purchased it here, but it might have come from Thailand, Indonesia, Sri Lanka. It is the Dambro. It is not because we don't have any good scientists or we don't have carpenters, but they have a they have a system in place that can produce the same size materials which can be screwed here, which can be come here and then you screw and put it in place. And they have also a system to transport it, ship it to these different countries and still make a profit. But here we cannot afford to, to do it. The same thing with the, I think when this whole innovation system studies have also emerged from the industrial sector. Japanese, the Koreans, and we see this all the Suzuki, the Kia. They are now they are dominating the whole car market. Because they know it. They are not doing a lot of research on automobile or maybe you know any engineering. US might be doing, but then they don't have any car that basically runs on the road. So some companies, some organizations are able to do things better. And why others are not able to do it better? So people studied these kind of things and they realized that that innovation is a is a process and innovation happens only when different pieces of knowledge. Because somebody is maybe having a, a knowledge about tires. Somebody might be having a knowledge about fluid dynamics. Somebody might have a knowledge about maybe ergonomics, maybe the seating arrangement. Somebody might have a no, knowledge about maybe efficiencies. So if you, if you, only when you put all these kind of things together, then only you know your competence as a sector, your competence will be there. There are several publications which are talking about, for instance, the new extension is just written in 2012. It basically articulated what is the role of extension within the agricultural innovation system and what new capacities are needed. Because our existing capacities are not enough to deal with the new challenge, new, newer programs. So the other publications, I am basically giving the cover images, you know, the references are all there in, in the documents that are in the, in the paper. So these are all documents which we should be aware about. And we should be, we should be reading this kind of thing and we should be able to, to comment on it. And then I say, told about invention is always not necessary for innovation to happen. Technical knowledge is not the starting point for innovation to happen. 
with the existing knowledge, a lot could be done in terms of reorganizing the, the different things. And transferring invention, this is something which we have been trying to do in extension. So this is not enough because there are so many other kind of things also needs to be done simultaneously. And people also, and this also, people also talk about that innovation is not a forced research task. Like, okay, people do research, then after that we go there and then take it to the, to the last mile. No. Research also has a, has, a, has, a place, has a place to play in innovation to happen because there's a lot of technological adaptation happens when it is being scaled up, when it goes to the other region. So, so we need to have a rounded understanding of innovation. And the, the topic here is that, that this process can be managed and facilitated. And then extension can play a major role in it, provided we, we develop, we acquire the kind of capacities on how do we enable uh, innovation. So this is the same picture which I just repeated. Just to, to make the same point, a lot of organizations are here, but many times the efficiency of the system is because how how these different actors in an innovation system. So you can take any example. For example, you know, this is a, maybe I can take, give an example of a horticulture sector. This is a study which we did a few years back on even organizations, if you take the, so why we are not in a, why we don't have a kind of a competence in horticulture? India produces a large number. In terms of production, we might be big in many things, but when it comes to export competitiveness, there are many reasons why we are not in a position to do it, because for innovation to happen, many of these organizations should work together. Dealing with, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. So everybody brings a different set of knowledge, try to put it together. If it, if it doesn't happen, and most of the time it doesn't happen for a number of reasons. So which we studied in terms of why organizations are not in a position to work together. So this applies to any sector if you take. We work on the sugar sector, you take any, no, we did on the, the spices, many sectors. Collaboration doesn't happen, even public, public, private, public, public partnerships are difficult. Then forget about the public, the private partnership. So these are the kind of the problems which people and why everybody is concerned about innovation? Because everybody feels that we are not getting the returns from the investment made in, made in many of these different organizations. Commodity boards, uh, research organizations, the education institutions. Everybody is trying to do whatever no, they are able to do. But, uh, but there is no proper mechanisms to exchange combined knowledge. And there is no, it's limited scaling up. Because everybody is now talking about scaling up. And they are looking for people who can scale up. I will just show you the later on when I am come, come, coming to that. So we don't get the innovation and impact at a scale. So if you look at the Niti IO documents or planning emissions, the upper documents, they all talk about, okay, you know, business as usual doesn't work anymore. But then people are struggling. So what is the next business model? How can we you know, really strengthen uh, all these arrangements so that we, we have a better innovation that, that comes. And uh, these are the, this is a definition of innovation system because we are now talking about innovation system. It is not about a new technology developed. So it's a network of actors, organizations, individuals, so working together. But then we also need to recognize the policies and institutional arrangements. This is the, the difference when we learned about the agricultural knowledge and information system, it is, which came up in the, in the 1980s, and the, in, and the innovation system is that it recognizes the role of multiple actors beyond the research, extension, education, pharma. Four, it talks about the private industry, but it talks about the consortiums, it talks about the policies, the rules, the regulations. So we need to, and because you don't have the right policies in place, the right institutions in place, institutions as ways of behavior, not as organizations. So then if you don't have these kind of things, then innovation is, is not happening. So one of the tools which we have been using in the agricultural innovation system studies is to do a innovation systems diagnosis. Who, who is who in the agricultural innovation system? If you take any sector, maybe the, any, any study, unless we understand who is who in the whole system, there's no point in trying to only trying to improve only one of the one of the organizations. Because even if you improve the efficiency of one organization, as long as the relationships are very weak, then you don't get the, the performance because it's a one plus one plus one. If you don't only one organization being strengthened is not going because it's all interactive interactions among multiple stakeholders. So we need to understand who are the actors, who are the pattern, what is the pattern of interaction? 
is it only they meet only during a conference people will come together or uh, they may meet maybe when the minister is in talk when it comes to the then i think all the different stakeholders come have tea and go away or are they really doing working together raising the resources together trying to address the problems together monitoring evaluating the programs together and then what are the policies the enabling what what constraint these innovation have several studies which we did are all there in the this uh, website so if you look at it so we have where we apply the innovation system framework to understand this the whole agricultural okay, innovation system and what constraint innovation i think this is very common sense in a sense but many people know about it but then when the studies have shown that like the mandate narrow organizational mandate other people are talking to the extension organizations in different because everybody now wanted nutrition to be addressed by extension so nutrition is an issue traditionally addressed by the health or the women and child development department but then nutrition sensitive agriculture who will talk about how we will promote nutrition sensitive agriculture so then the extension organizations have to play a major role but when you talk to the <coughs> talk to this uh, organization they will say we don't have any mandate on extension nutrition and we don't know anything about it and we are we are not, our capacities are also not being built up so some organization will say no no our no, role our only we only produce we develop machinery we put it in the museum we put it in the shelves and then we do not know the extension is weak we can blame extension is weak or farmers are not interested or private industry wanted everything free these are the usual kind of you know, reasons which we but how long we can play with this kind of thing so unless we unless you no know, the mandates so we need to have a look at the re look at the mandates funding every organization funded independently that's what i said about the you know, csir funded separately from the icr maybe on a common area where both could really work together they don't really you know work together So nutrition, national institute of nutrition. So you have the other home science colleges. There's a lot they can give and take, but uh, they are funded and evaluated separately, and limited involvement of other stakeholders in the governance. I thought to in the morning also, no, because we don't want the industry partners to sit in our research advisory committee or even in the extension advisory council. We will try to get a a farmer who don't really challenge us. so so we are not so governance is an issue hierarchies are top down there is no success stories in from nobody wanted to talk about failures and learning from failures now why things didn't happen and can we do something differently so these are all which are very common in many of the public sector organization then this mistrust public private civil society public sector people many people think i also told in the morning you know that private sector people because they are there because they don't got they haven't got a government job so many people believe like that and private people think that no because these people are so inefficient they have no sense of time but there's a lot of mistrust there are, it's not 100% true that all these kind of things in the sense this whole nip this national agricultural innovation program was basically brought where they put a condition that no if you are in a value chain project you should have <coughs> multiple actors otherwise the project program will not be fund, funded so many of the challenge funds many of them are now trying to competitive research grants So they are trying to make sure that no single PI, <coughs> one specific expertise funded are not promoted. They don't, they don't accept it for funding unless it is a consortia with the with the industry, farmer organization, and then you have to really indicate the impact pathway. Otherwise, the research proposals are not being accepted. It's not like we develop and then we find the output is a paper and then the matter ends there. Then capacity, lack of the soft skills, functional skills is an issue. but <coughs> capacities to collaborate uh, capacity to manage the manage the relationships i think uh, address the issues related to the mistrust uh, <coughs> negotiation so there is a lot of skills that are needed especially when you go to the top you need more especially you need a more these kind of capacities are thank you these capacities are, are important when you especially when you go to the top hierarchy but then there is no mechanism to <clears throat> to train people in 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 this area lack of exposure second man <clears throat> second man is common in in, in outside countries people from the private sector can come and work in the public sector five years then you can go people can go and work in the private sector so this kind of a cross learning so this is not happening and this whole research extension farm this is a linear paradigm whereas we have been talking about systems paradigm for the last two decades maybe more than that for the last three decades 
But the innovation systems ideas, you know, came in the maybe in the last uh, two decades. And the policy, there's no policy in terms of bringing all the coherence among all these different actors. So in many of our, our research, we found that. So we looked at cases where successful cases where there is a scale. So try to understand what are the functions, actions, and tools that are needed to achieve innovation and impact. So here, I think we have a reference on the whole innovation management paper that we did to understand how innovation really happens. So we found that different actors are involved and different actors perform many of these different functions. So innovation management itself is becoming a major kind of an area. So, and then uh, it is something like, you know, you did the business case, now, how the whole, in the MBAs, all these programs, you have a large number of business cases, but unfortunately we don't have too many business cases, we don't have enough cases, teaching cases in, in extension, in general in social sciences, we have, we are especially in agriculture, we are very weak. So we look at different cases and try to, we found that you need to perform a large number of other functions. Transferring technology has a, can only help if other functions are also being performed by different organizations. So the role of extension has been broadened and then we have a much better understanding about the, the knowledge being held by different types of actors in an innovation system. And this is how innovation and impact will, will happen. So people have thought that we need to have maybe you know, more new business models are required, maybe like innovation platforms, Agribusiness incubation is only one part, part of it, but value chain consortiums, joint project, stakeholder, councils, funding of research by other organizations. So people are now trying to do all these kind of things so that we reform our existing, or maybe you know, we change the status quo so that now we can do better. So these ideas related to agricultural innovation systems, innovation platforms, so these are the new capacities which we need if we really get into, into the jobs which we really deserve. But otherwise, now, as I said in the morning, you know, we will end up, we will be only looking at the public sector, we will be only looking at KVKs as SMS or maybe as an assistant professor kind of a thing. So we need to broaden, see we can broaden our vision only if we start reading and understanding many of these, uh, many of these briefs and publications. So this is a we used to apply this innovation management function. So this is a paper which we did for a few on how do you upscale climate smart agriculture and what is the role of extension advisory services. So this is a review. This is only done by a, we did a review of four cases and this was done only through a, only through literature review. So I think these are the cases in conservation agriculture in Zambia which has reached millions of hectares. I think the SRI, in the Sustainable Rice Intensification in Vietnam, several years we could look, and then the other is this drought tolerant managed drought tolerant maize in Africa, which has Simit was behind it, but then it has gone to about eight. I think the whole the, the sub-Saharan Africa is on maize, so it has gone to about no, 12, 15 countries spread widely. Another is this whole climate insurance in. So we looked at these reports, studies on these things. And looked at what are the what are the different organizations played, what roles they play using this innovation management framework, and come up with a publication on what is the role of extension advisory service in promoting in upscaling climate smart agriculture. As I said, upscaling climate smart agriculture is not agronomy. It is extension actually. Now we need to use that no agronomic findings from agronomy, all those kind of things, but then we need to be very clear that upscaling happens. We need to do things differently, and we use we need to use new kind of a kind of a framework. So, what does it all mean? Whatever I said about no, the expanding role of innovation, our understanding has moved. We have no new frameworks like innovation management, uh, innovation knowledge offering. So, there's a lot of new ideas are come. And the point is, unless we learn about these things, I think we don't have a very future. We will become easily irrelevant in the coming days if we don't really change or maybe you know fundamentally revisit our our basic foundations of the discipline. Otherwise, you know, we have a very bleak future. So people now talk about extension should be about facilitating change. Facilitation for development. So this is a, a skill which was identified by the even for the by the GFRA globally, you know, with their kind of you know consultations and people said our people don't know how to facilitate 
facilitation happens at two levels facilitation at the at the ground level where we work with the farmer but then facilitation is also at the higher level in terms of multidisciplinary groupings uh, inter institutional uh, projects it also happens at the at the policy level in terms of uh, multi stakeholder working groups the government of india uh, have many kind of a consultation mechanisms and many times in the we really don't know how to be a kind of a how to lead this how to facilitate this kind of a thing so the role of extension has changed it is now becoming a more of an intermediary making many to many relationship with different actors it's no longer about only research extension kind of a farmer and uh, i think if you look at the training module on facilitation for development this is something which comes did with theory because the government of orissa realized that our we don't have a training of trainers module on on this kind of a topic so we need to this is only this is to train and use extension officers of the department so we need to work on these kind of areas and then we need to learn and that is also one of the reasons that a new course was introduced in the in the icr subject matter bsa uh, for enabling innovation because in the last though, though agro innovation systems have been there for the last 20 years we didn't include these kind of now, emerging ideas around innovation into the curricula so this is over the reason so this new course which is talking about agricultural innovation systems enabling innovation and scaling up i would say you know these are the areas which we should basically you need to strengthen your understanding in this particular area and another area is because we also need to be know about the tools and approaches to enable innovation A lot of work happened on the whole innovation platforms because people are struggling how to make because governments have invested in a lot of organizations but then how to make them to work together so innovation platform so these are many of the cdi agencies have been trying to do many governments have been trying to set up policy working groups innovation platforms so what roles we will play in all these kind of things so we are being invited so we need to play a role can we facilitate these kind of interactions do we have the skills or is there anybody else who can do it better in most cases no but then we are neither they are not here because we are because our capacities are limited we have not basically you know we cannot do another is this no i talked about the whole innovation platform you know? so this is what a brief which i showed you earlier because how do you promote innovation platform so there's a lot of literature why we need to build innovation platform i think in our projects also we try to to do maybe one project in pondicherry where we try to create an innovation platform where we try to doing a project on fodder see the fodder is a major problem in all over india but because in the fodder doesn't it falls through the the gaps between is it a animal husbandry problem or is it a department of agriculture problem who produces who should produce fodder and is it a uh, Okay, milk society is kind of a problem. So how can we bring all these different people if you have to address the issue of green fodder? So this is a major kind of a challenge that is constraining, I think our, I think livestock productivity. So if you have to address these kind of a problems, you need to have different people from the different organizations coming, talking, reviewing the progress, finding out new ways of doing these kind of things. and uh, i don't want to go into the deep because it can be set up at different levels national platforms we did a work with the ndgb and set up a a forum of innovation policy working group and finally the stakeholders decided that okay it should be the ndgb should lead it because they have the more respect they can come and they can get people to come together but in some places like in the youth in the pondicherry they said it is the the river that they earlier talked about that the gandhi bit for the veterinary animals they should basically lead the but then so people should be able but then it needs to be facilitated it's not like having a meeting proceedings are being made then the the, the matter ends there because these are all dynamic mechanisms to address specific problem and these are areas where we have a competitive advantage if you really study if you really understand that these aspects very well another is this uh, i they told about no this whole identifying stage So now there are mechanisms. Even there are a lot of public. How do you identify the different stakeholders, and how do we engage stakeholders? So these are ideas which we should know, no? because it's always easy to say you form a committee, you form a committee, you get the different stakeholders. Are all stakeholders interested? 
how to buy how to get a buy from the different stakeholders to come and address specific health problems and then the whole stakeholder participation in the the governance mechanism the governance board of organization whether it's a research or extension so are you really looking for people who are comfortable who don't want to challenge our our existence i think this is what make, most of the time you know, we have been also seeing you know the the continual review teams they only select people who don't really make a, a major hue and cry so that the status quo could be maintained so i think if you really want to improve can we change some of these uh, aspects this policy working group i basically already talked about it need skilled facilitators so if you facilitate that this skill there is a possibility to market that specific skill if you really work together because you need basically the world needs people who can do these kind of a thing so the real kind of concept is this scaling up no everybody is about scaling up no nobody is talking about adoption you are not talking about diffusion people want to know whether you know anything about scaling up so when you go to an interview you will ask do you know anything about scaling up you cannot say no no i don't i don't know you look at the whole the these are all, i just put it i just put to the cover images of the recent publications and these are all the things and everybody wants to see so if, it, if we have we have to enhance our knowledge in this particular area of scaling up this is also important for another reason i will just tell you this is a very important slide i told you in the morning that no jobs are not coming where there will be an extension word will be there so don't think that you can only apply in those positions where there is an extension specialist is being invited all these positions you see scientist adoption scaling and innovation systems this is the position advertised recently by simit we could have applied many of you could have probably applied if we had a, a cv or an experience that matches this one look at the next step, next uh, call ilvi scaling and partnership specialist they are not getting people open until fill just see because there are you can get breeders you can get agronomists you can get plant physiologists but you are not getting there are plenty of them and the organization also have people but then they need people who can do the economics also don't fit into this category similarly the last one just see international this nephew of position advertise international specialist on agricultural for innovation and advisory systems if we have learned these kind of things broaden our understanding about extension is now talking about rural advisory services extension advisory services innovation in systems we could have it so organizations are under pressure to show evidence of impact the cda if you look at all these organizations unless they show the evidence of impact they, they are not able to get the next set of funding so and how do you, and then how impact is possible only because if you look you don't partner or Single organization is not achieving impact. Traditionally, they, many of them they were only partnering with the science organizations. We can always, you know, the similar partner with ICA, state of Utah universities. We will have a partnership, but then you need to have partnerships with NGOs, partnership with in terms of the private sector. If you really want to show upskill, but then do we have the skills to partner? Partnership is a skill. So can we? We can learn. Yes, we can learn. through theory we can learn through cases we can also learn through kind of a practice that is why i talked about the importance of internship at the masters level there was a proposal which was basically fine we put up in the at least during the summer break internship compulsory for the masters but then i said in agree to that uh, because they wanted to make it everything look similar whether it's an agronomy or see it it's all different right? because we need a different set of exposure and these days many organizations will first ask you whether do you have any work experience do you have done any internship you say no so then there are other people who have already done internship and come there that's what i said firma uh, master of social msw was they have all come with internship so whether they will take you or they will take them so these are the questions which we need to and now the people are doing even even in some cases when the organization even doesn't even wanted to do internship people are now asking for opportunities to do internship volunteer people are even people are many people come to us and many organizations say that we don't need any we don't need any any funding we don't need any salary but can you take us as an intern and we will do work for you free so this is the kind of a challenge which we should be and then these are and so that's why we brought all these advertisement uh, titles 
because these are the areas where new job opportunities are there so if you don't understand innovation the role of extension advisory service in enabling innovation and in, and the importance in scaling up we have a problem and so scaling up so there's a difference between scaling out and scaling up what normally we do through kvps and our are all scaling out and the many times our strategy is that we will do do the same project so we did it in four four villages it is a success story so we wanted to do it in 10 villages then ask additional funding to do it in the district level then they will say we will do it in another the same thing in another district but scaling up is about catalyzing institutional and policy change and many of and as i said that because organizations are looking for scaling up person and they are not getting it because we because we people don't know how do you how do you scale up but then now the now many people are trying to fill up that area that gap is that gap is being addressed because i think this is a this is from a different project which we did if you do the scaling out we will be on this x axis always over a period of time we don't reach the users of knowledge the, our our access this in work but when you make institutional and policy changes so advocacy how do we engage in policy advocacy that is also another skill we is also part of a broader facilitation so policy engagement how do you basically basically facilitate policy policy changes and this was an area which extension should strengthen its uh, the full area because many projects pilot gets stuck at that stage 4 because you don't know how to and you don't have partners who can help you with the policy policy is not policy research policy is about you know to understand ways and means of generating different types of evidence that will suit the decision maker some might need a paper some might need a policy brief some might need only a, a field visit some people get convinced on or maybe some but some people will Uh, we can means when the other stakeholders you know, demand for it it's not like we do a policy research come out with a policy brief and then say okay the, and the policy is changed so we need to understand her uh, and understand this kind of thing and the cgr again because i'm talking about so now we have an online this approach innovation and scaling an introductory online course so you can take you all can take this course what stops you from okay now if you have a scaling up is say is a unit in, under your in your course So why are why are we should be worried about having not enough the plenty of references? Plenty of references. But then, at the master's level, you should not expect that okay there will be an MSc, there will be a standard book will be there, we will read and write the exam. Those days are all gone because we are competing with other people who are basically easily catching up on many of these terms. and equipping their capacities we should be very very careful about 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 this and uh, this is what i said today the most actually you know when uh, you really approach us that they can because they are facing this problem of scaling up so they basically want their scientists to be trained on scaling up so we organized this training with iri and tells for 15 16 may 2018 on scaling up it can say development center idc they said they are scientists 20 of them engineers uh, uh, physiologists agronomists wide variety of people as a center to whether they don't know they only know they know their work they are very good scientists they can publish a research paper they can get a publication in i think high impact journals but the governments which are funding them for watershed development or promoting pulses across the state they are looking they wanted the results in terms of they do they, they are not funding you for a research paper so we or we have got this training for the ecosystem sector for scaling it which we which we learn by review understanding the whole kind of a topic developing the kind of a different cases you cannot simply train 20 different scientists and come they must sit like this to, to listen to a lecture on definitions of scaling up you need to have practical cases on how scaling up has happened if you don't scale up what will happen so these are basically cases to think what on group work so this is how we basically organize this uh, uh, this so i think so this is another area which we need to so i think basically wanted to conclude at this stage because you have the paper with you two points adversary services can play a major role in enabling innovation but simply saying it won't help 
we need to we need to have new perspectives on innovation and scaling up so you should read the emerging literature no doubt about it we need to do more research on how innovation happens and the belief of the adoption study the problem is we look at a very really short time span and with one simple i think replacement of a technology much of the technological change studies have come from a review of maybe what happens over the long span for the years what change in a particular area and how that change has really happened and what is the contribution of technology in that one what is the contribution of other factors in 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 that we recently did a study in the mulkanur is a major women dairy cooperative in silga so in the years so mulkanur has been considered as one of the very successful uh, so we did a study for ilri the livestock research institute to understand and we used a different kind of framework to look at how the technological changes happen and uh, we should not measure the success of adoption only by the whether one technology one variety has progressed well or not even if may have failed so what capacities were built by introducing different types of technologies in a particular system so we need a, a long we need a long term study it doesn't mean we need a 20 year study the point is we need to look at a 20 years experience to come out with a really uh, looking at what really happened and understand the technology and we definitely need more cases so people like organizations like irma has a case van so they create because we are teaching people so you need to have to know about different cases which could be which people could work on so the second point is that many organizations are looking for people who understand innovation innovation systems and scaling up and we shouldn't miss this opportunity as i said other people who are our competitors we should be very very clear if they are basically enhancing their capacity then we need to make sure that we should be also we should be also doing it then as it comes the new revised the curriculum i think has for this like you know, this is a this is a new course and then this whole extension landscape is a new course which we introduced because because we want to understand what understand the extension also we simply wish to be only understanding maybe ICTs, mobile, gender. We also need to understand what is globally changing in extension. So the whole extension landscape is to look at extension reforms. We need to look at. So you need to understand what is extension. What is happening globally in extension? Only focusing only on your MSc or research topic will not give you a kind of a profile of understanding the whole sector. And as I said before in the morning. This is a global topic. Extension and advisory services, rural advisory services, we call these days. It's a global topic, so we should be prepared ourselves. We should be prepared for that kind of a global market. So, but then only taking a course, writing the, and then getting an OGP, a nine OGP. This is all material. Okay, it's important. I'm not saying we should not study, but un, but if you don't enhance the, our understanding of that particular area. I think uh, we will be. And then it's also important for the faculty also to update because we have new curricula, new topics, new uh, because we haven't really upgraded our curricula for for a long time. So that's also one of them. And then also look at this whole ESA network. So for a lot of resources, new resources. There are sections on resources on all different. We are also adding new topics. So all the global publications with a small commentary on. So we are also trying to identify those kind of things. We publish blog practices. So I think uh, we should also look at uh, some of some of these. I was saying that like, I wrote a mail to all these people. I got that I was thinking of that. So I was thinking of asking him to send me that. So he finally he got it to like uh, a cutting end. So I wrote a mail to all of you, like you know, introducing yes. I think you all got it. But I don't see anybody even say got it. No acknowledgement. I have been sending you blog good practices. <laughs> no, not even acknowledge saying that. Earlier we used to at least acknowledge somebody sent a publication or something. And then if this is not interest, this is not of interest to you. What else is we are interested? Because we are not sending you happy birthday, Diwali wishes. You get it in the Facebook, WhatsApp group. We are not talking about professional aspect. So I sometimes wonder what is the level of passion our students have. It's not only you know. I think we have been on the scene. I want to make last point. I want to say no. Even in the house scene in Facebook, 
Then the people change the profile photo, you will get 100 likes. But one of the people who colleague wrote a blog, people don't, people just act as if they are not even seen. So we also need to think about it. We are about communication, feedback. See, we, we are the person who talk about all this about the importance of communication, importance of feedback. But then as a profession, are we providing any feedback to our own people who write? Trying any of these kind of things, we part. Because even as our Facebook group, which has about 20,000 20, people. And people are there because they are saying find it value. But, uh, if it, but then, we some, some people, maybe a handful of them, maybe, you know, just appreciate or maybe. It's not, we are not publishing. We are really a platform which publishes other people's work. But we have no professional kind of. Uh, I think we need to think about it. We need to rethink. Are we doing Because if you don't enter it, your own colleagues will publish, then what is their incentive to publish? So then finally we will all pull this whole discipline down. We will pull it down. So this is also important to provide feedback. Uh, so I think, I think I'll, maybe I think this is my last slide and I will stop here. So I think, so you, this is the Chris India website. You look, look at the SR, then you should also look, this is the base Facebook group. Uh, Facebook as a because you should also use it also for you know, personal is fine, but then you should also use it for professional groups, be a member, so I think there are updates every day on what is happening globally, regionally, in India, links to workshops, links to training programs, and links to new publications. Yesterday we published it, we posted, it's a new FAO document on strengthening public sector, public extension. So it's like a consultation study which was started in some six countries, India got there, but then we should all learn about what is happening globally. I think I'll talk here. I think I, Thank you. Thank you for a mind-blowing and insightful idea, sir. Well, the session is open for interaction. Members who are present both online and offline can now interact with the guest speaker. Uh, so I think, sir, uh, really we enjoyed your lecture. You have given a, a wonderful session on the enabling innovations. Uh, I have a, a couple of... Uh, it's not a question kind of uh, clarification. Really. So my first point is that, so we actually, as a research institute, we evolve new technologies kind of thing, and we uh, advocate uh, the farming community to adopt. But still, uh, you know, uh, so the adoption rate of uh, most of the technologies, particularly the water management technologies, we found that, actually recently we made a, a regression, extensive research on uh, 40 years of water management research in India. Uh, so the one of the key findings is that uh, so the work, the adoption of water management technologies only around 10 or 12 percent only. So so my point is that uh, so though the state and central governments uh, you know uh, introduce different extension uh, uh, institutions or mechanisms or models. But still, the adoption is very, very poor. Uh, so, what new model we can think of to enhance the adoption rates? So that is one thing. And the second one is uh, the institutions. Since you work on uh, institutions, uh, actually, I have done a lot of work on uh, the water management institutions, watershed institutions, kind of thing. Uh, so most of the institutions, particularly the institutions which are formed for, for the natural resource management, as long as uh, the state agency support is there, so they function. Once uh, the state uh, agencies withdraw their support, so the functioning, uh, the question, functioning is a questionable, and uh, most of the cases uh, the institutions become defunct or dysfunctional. So, so what kind of uh, uh, you know, so the institutional innovation. So that time, you know, so we have rigorously explored uh, the uh, theory of induced innovation model develop in aggregate development by the Ratna and Haya. So their models just we follow, but still it's, uh, 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 the issue is they remain uncertain. So what kind of uh, innovation model we can think of to address these issues? So, okay. So I the first question is about uh, I don't think there is any kind of a universal model that will, because this is a, the challenge is to identify the locally relevant institutional model. 
So in some cases, like the, like the research projects also, which we have also seen, like the different projects, they wanted people to reflect. So I think you have a technical output and there is an institutional output where they reflect on what is the kind of process, what went wrong, what was done, what is the kind Unless that is also an output from the research technical process, which people reflect. So the other mechanisms to reflect. So this is where the innovation platform of ideas are now coming. People creating innovation platforms at different levels. So that it is, it is not at the end of the project. We have a review and then say that, okay, no, things have been really worked. So we are trying to see how this kind of a participatory monitoring, all those kind of things we built into it. So, and then the answer is no universal model because these models have to be identified at the location, at the level. And then coming to the other, the second question on sustainability, and this is also an issue that is now. How, I, my answer is that we need to learn from successful cases and try to understand why some of these, some of these, some of these organizations are really working very well and what practices which they adopt. So the research should be about learning from the successes and, and uh, trying to draw lessons. This is what we did in the, the, the innovation management paper to identify. If four cases have been very successful, maybe 100 may not have been successful. Is that something that we can learn from these four in terms of what people have, what people, organizations, what institutions and policy changes might have happened, and then try to develop if you know, new ways of working. So, I know I'm not answering it straight, but what I wanted to focus is on the kind of a, the process which we need to, fundamental process which we need to adopt in our research projects. Because in extension activity, because we don't look into successful project, or, we don't do a mega project, we do, for example, the four projects which we looked at globally. So you don't have to, this is not a review. Because there is no enough cost to published in that particular area. So we could we do a research on the research to come out with the, maybe what would be the, what needs to be done. Otherwise, we will end up doing the same kind of thing. We will have one more project. Then after that, the end of the year, the evaluation will also come to that maybe from 10% it might have gone to 10 to 15%, but still. And we want this. Then there is also NR versus, NR is a complex. It's not a, it's not a technology substitution. Because it is happening at different levels for technology, institutions, policies. It is not like a one variety replacing another variety. So, adoption type of models work in simple technology substitution. But when it comes to natural resource management, we need to have much more systems oriented kind of a frameworks. So, that's what people have been trying to do in terms of social learning. So many other kinds of tools, frameworks to look and understand. I think I will maybe stop here. Any more questions from the students, sir? For is it too much overload today? <laughs> I challenging you on everything and uh, as I said before, my purpose is not to not to say that we are we are not useful. The purpose is to to encourage you to look at new areas. It's not to say that don't feel that okay we don't know anything kind of a thing. We should now think that okay these are the areas which we should study. Okay. Sir, so we are speaking about uh, public private partnership and tourism. Uh, to what extent it will be feasible at ground level, sir, at farmers level? Uh, the one-hand solution for all the farmers' problem is tourism. Uh, how we can make it possible at the I think we need to split this question because tourism, what is tourism? Tourism is existence of multiple organizations. It is, uh, for instance, in extension we can take as a tourism because public-private stuff, there are NGOs are all, all those things. Public-private partnerships are a different, different layer. Yeah? So, we there is a every reason to believe that coordination, coordinating pluralism is a is a major is a you need a capacity to coordinate pluralistic even extension thing. Then not take the power of it. Take the extension. At the moment our capacity to coordinate a pluralistic extension system is weak. Many people believe that the public system should coordinate. But public system, who is there? Just take the case of the Department of Agriculture. 
people have reached their most of them you have done a phd at the college and they worked in the you have become an assistant director job director you just basically they have never got any kind of a training in the last 20 years on these aspects like the whole topic what is collaboration how do you make collaboration have they been have they been exposed to different cases of collaboration have they been have you are you able to learn from many of these examples so if you don't build this capacity within our public system or any in system the capacity to coordinate pluralism what do you think of this experience how can we find so these are there are few gaps in capacity we are not just talking but then the really when you talk about the very little things you can take this of art form and you got the whole mind of it so we all that where is there is there real collaboration happening actually what is speaking here in the review this is a review which we did for the government india when we looked at it we saw the money comes then we gave the department to distribute it that is not the purpose for the setting up the art form because at the district level there is no there is no capacity there is no respect seniority there are so many issues are there who is basically handling it then finally now what is happening is that the money comes from the secretary and the executive department the money comes and then uh, you feel interested so some of the departments are not even interested so they don't even attend the meeting they will think we have enough problem why you take one more project and then uh, we don't have enough people there are many reasons so, so this is a major kind of a and we need to address this address this issue of capacity before we really start speaking about whether that can be a solution thank you sir okay, okay. thank you sir a renowned researcher grew in eva and me out showed in eva and me a good teacher student friendly professor and an able administrator with these appreciations we are delighted to invite dr c kartike professor and head department of agriculture extension and rural sociology tna mandapur to offer the work thanks respected director class dean agriculture uh, senior professors uh, colleagues and students who are joined uh, online and offline Good evening, Tonanda. Before I get into this uh, formal word of thanks, I would like to give uh, remarks about this lecture. So uh, once again, I want to uh, congratulate our uh, speaker because he is uh, strengthening our extension professionalism in the country, not only in the country but uh, in the South Asia, South Asia, through uh, organizations such as ASA, that is Agricultural Extension in South Asia, GFRAS, and CRISP. Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services and uh, uh, Centre for Research and Innovation and Science Policy. Uh, of course, uh, this lecture is quite interesting. Yet, uh, whatever we have been exposed to this lecture is fully uh, about the new concept that is extension advisory services or enabling innovation. So he has started from scratch. That is, what is innovation? How to enable an innovation? so which is all required by our extension graduates uh, in the extension workers and he has also highlighted the implications for extension and advisory services then the capacities that is needed to enable the innovation scaling up innovation and the impact so innovation management functions in scaling up this uh, climate uh, smart agriculture innovation then he has also given this a uh, five step approach to stakeholder participation and the importance of internships uh, to be done by the graduates in extension then again uh, he has also uh, exposed uh, some literatures new literatures in extension almost uh, most of the slides uh, is highly professional which uh, talks about more inputs like uh, resource materials in extension like agricultural innovation systems then new extensionist roles strategies and capacities training module and facilitation for development putting heads together then moving up innovations to scale and so on so uh, the lecture is quite professional and uh, very relevant and useful of course the it is uh, very useful for addressing this new curricula already the syllabus for this pg and phd students have been revised and we are adapting this bsma 2022 uh, syllabus and this is one of the course which is included for MS students enabling innovation and uh, extension advisory services so i think this lecture uh, is quite useful for all the extension students and the scientists in agricultural extension so with this small note uh, i will get into this uh, formal water thanks 
first uh, at the outset i'd like to uh, sincerely thank our vice chancellor for uh, starting this uh, endowment series of lectures in all the departments because this is a way to inculcate the scientific temper among all the scientists and students uh, of the tamil nadu agriculture university so it's a wonderful venture and it is being done in almost all departments and this is our turn for extension and uh, we are uh, Uh, listening to this endowment lecture by Dr. Rashid Suleiman, so I thank our uh, Vice Chancellor in this regard. Then I also wholeheartedly thank our Dean, School of Postgraduate Studies, uh, Dr. Sindhil, who has uh, taken initiative to sponsor this uh, program. And uh, today, uh, the Dean, uh, School of Postgraduate Studies, in charge, Dr. Vidya Sapan Sir, who has uh, came who came over here and uh, delivered the welcome address and encouraged. Uh, all the participants in this uh, endowment lecture i uh, profusely thank our director cars dr suresh master for introducing the speaker and for encouraging all the social scientists of uh, tamil nadu agriculture university both uh, in teaching as well as research so he is a motivating force and he is providing all administrative support even for the conduct of this endowment lecture not only for this lecture but for all our steps He is uh, guiding force behind us, so I thank our director cards in this regard. Then I also thank uh, our speaker, endowment lecture speaker, who has spent the whole day since morning 10:30 to 1 o'clock in the morning. So he has motivated all of our extension graduates and the faculty in Coimbatore campus, and in fact he has changed the mindset of the students who are looking for jobs. and he has motivated the students that you can provide jobs you can you have to think out of box you can work on your own just like he said himself as an example and role uh, so he he has uh, given this thought provoking lecture also today afternoon is quite useful and relevant and it will be a well taken i hope the students might have enjoyed his lecture which is quite professional And I thank all my colleagues, Dr. Ranjit Prabhu, Dr. Madhula Devi, Dr. Sogan, and Dr. Jani Grani, who have shown that various committees in organizing this uh, endowment lecture. Then I also thank all the PG students who have joined offline and online, and all the participants who have joined online for this endowment lecture, uh, for showing their interest and their enthusiasm in attending this uh, endowment lecture. So I thank one and all for this uh, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, sir.